Coach Luke Moffitt, welcome to the podcast, sir. Thank you for having me. Yes, sir. Just been named to the Iowa Hall of Fame, the Glen Brand Iowa Hall of Fame. How'd you find out about that one? Um, Jim Miller actually showed up and it's not really, I mean, he always pops his head into the wrestling room, watches practice maybe once or twice a year. So I, it was nothing out of the ordinary. And then he kind of told me in front of the whole team. So it was, uh, it was pretty cool. Caught me off guard. <laughs> so when was that a couple months back then? Uh, I want to say January maybe or December. So, and then he, you know, he always gives the boys a pep talk. So appreciate when he stops by. Man, who's better than Jim Miller? Guy's got a lot of energy. <laughs> oh my God. He's awesome. Yeah. Every time you get off the phone with them, you're like, I got to step my game up. <laughs> <laughs> so I, one of the things I was dying to ask you about, you know, I grew up when the season came out and I watched it. I don't even know how many times on, on tape record. I even shaved my head because TJ Williams had a shaved head in it. And my mom thought I was a lunatic. So I looked like I had like leukemia or something. It was crazy. Like that, doc, that documentary was so influential. How often were those guys around? Like when you guys were throughout that season? It, it was constant. I mean, they were, they were everywhere. I mean, the one day they were following me, they were at my house when I was eating breakfast, they walked to class with me. They're in the car with me. Uh, they were around all the time. I mean, I think they got, I think their camera guys got smoked by a couple headgears, you know, during practice a few times, but uh, those guys were, were, uh, were fun to have around, but they were, they were around all the time. So like how many, how many guys would be at your house filming? Uh, there'd be two, there'd be two guys, <clears throat> but that was the big thing. I mean, they, Oh, you play the guitar you got to play the guitar and I'm nervous. You know, I'm so nervous. I'm like, I can't play the guitar. And, uh, they're like, Hey, we'll just set up a tripod. We won't even be in here. So that, that was kind of how that deal went down, but, uh, it's kind of funny. Should have maybe hit the guitar that day. <laughs> <laughs> no way, man. I, I, I distinctly remember that scene. That's how I got turned on to Leonard Skinner was from that, that song. Yeah. Now it's a good one. So when you guys are signing up for this, do you have any idea like the scope and the depth of how they're going to shape the season and the narrative? No, no. I just remember when I first saw it, man, they left a lot of good things out. I mean, there's a, some, some, some good stuff they had film on that didn't make the cut, I guess. Um, and originally what Zaleski told me, it was supposed to be, um, four one hour segments and then they cut it to, a two hour deal or an hour and a half or whatever it was. But yeah, there was a lot of good stuff in there that didn't make the cut, but it'd be interesting to find that's <laughs> some archive somewhere. If you could get your hands on that, it'd be pretty cool. What do you have in mind? What, what things are you remembering that didn't make it? Oh, uh, just some of the scuffles in the room and, you know, just, just fun stuff, you know? Mm-hmm. So. When it's like, I, I heard you say in another podcast that, you know, it's, it was really a re, you know, kind of a reality show and you don't know how it's going to turn out. Did you guys feel that it was, was it accurate or was it more of like a kind of a dramatic slant that necessarily wasn't there? Uh, I don't know. I, I think there was a lot of, <laughs> I mean, if you slipped up, they were going to get it, you know, they were going to put you on blast, you know, so <laughs> it did, you know, it, it, it touched on some of the, you know, the reality of wrestling. I mean, it's a tough sport. You know, you don't always get what you want, but you got to, you know, put your best foot forward and give yourself the best chance to win. And it doesn't always happen, but uh, no, it, it was pretty accurate. And those were, those were challenging times or transitionary times for the Hawks, you know, going through those years, you know, in terms of 90s, I think Iowa won nine out of 10. And then 2001, Minnesota wins in Carver. Were you at Iowa at that time? Yeah, that was my redshirt season. So I wrestled two years at Iowa Central, and then I – it was a perfect situation for me because, you know, I, I wanted to give myself the best chance to win, so I'm like, Schwab's a senior, you know, defending national champ. You know, he tech followed me. The only time I ever been tech followed <laughs> in the folk-style match. We no. had to be in Iowa. At Iowa Central. 
And about wow. About the third period, the brakes came off, and it was it was ugly. <laughs> was it was it close before that? Uh, I think first period maybe, but it, it steamrolled. I mean, I couldn't keep up with that guy, but that's the guy I wanted to see how close I could close the gap on him. So, I mean, using that red shirt year, my first year at Iowa was uh, a year for me to, you know, see if I could close the, the gap on some of those great wrestlers in the room, you know, TJ Williams, Mike Zadick, you know, Eric Jurgens, you know, Doug Schwab, Jody Stripmatter even. I mean, he was a 25 punter, but he walked around the same weight as me at 41 most of the time. Um, then you had Bill Zadick and, you know, Tom Brand. I mean, you had – I couldn't think of a better wrestling room in the world that you could place yourself in um, during that time. Lincoln McElravey. Um, yeah, I was just going to ask about Lincoln. I'm I'm having Daniel Agali on the podcast later today. Is the guy who beat McElravey, you know, a couple times at the big yeah. dance. And uh, but no, growing up, Lincoln McElravey was awesome. And I wasn't sure if he was still training after 2000 or not. Yeah, no, he was. Uh, he was my guy in the mornings, like. I'd go in, you know, a couple mornings a week and you'd have your drill days and then your lift days. Um, and then it was like, you're walking into practice and you're like, who am I going to wrestle today? <laughs> World level or NCAA champ or, you know, whatnot. Uh, I still remember, uh, it was a home football game. So all the fans came in to watch practice and Lincoln Moffitt my partner today <laughs> just just beat the shit out of me you know? <laughs> I had I had him almost taken down one time and he like bounced off his head to his feet and then double leg me I mean it was you think you had him and he, he's he's really good so yeah, yeah I mean, fun, to, fun to wrestle and you had Lincoln McRavey Olympian Obviously, uh, Mike Zadick, future Olympian, Doug Schraub, future Olympian, Bill Zadick, world champ, Joe Williams, TJ Williams. Like, oh my lord, that's a and like you said, Jurgens, you know, really amazing and strip matter. I mean, oh my god, what a room! Yeah, no, it was it was baptism by fire. I mean, you just throw yourself in there, and there's not really an easy day, any day. <laughs> no, I can't imagine so. Well, you know, growing up in Iowa, did you always want to be a Hawkeye? Yeah. I mean, that's, you know, that was what you grew up watching, you know, IPTV, the big, you know, big dual meets. And I would say, I don't even really know if I had a choice. I think it was, Iowa was the, the team, you know? Mm -hmm. And tell us about where you grew up, Esterville. What, what kind of community was that? Northwest Iowa, small town. Um, you know, it's, it, I mean, can't say we were like real good at wrestling but we had a group my little group of friends you know we traveled everywhere my dad took us everywhere um to train to compete freestyle you know pretty much we were on the road putting miles on the minivan I mean, that was what we did year, you know pretty much year round i was gonna say because that's that's pretty far out there um was is it like close to Ames or still quite a ways from that no, it's close to Lake Okaboji. I don't know. That's clear up northwest. So it's not really close to anything big. You know? And when you, you won state as a junior, second as a senior, if you look back at like middle school or high school, when was your kind of breakthrough year where things really started clicking for you, where you had that belief? Uh, I think fifth grade, I wanted to quit. Fifth grade was a brutal year. Um, I don't even know if I was 500. <laughs> and that's when I started – you know, going to camps during the summers. Um, I started lifting about seventh grade and I was picking up on things and stuff started to get easier for me and my confidence, you know, in improved. I didn't want to quit anymore. And um, I mean, finally, when I got to high school, it was like, let's go. I mean, I've been wrestling these guys during the summers, these high school guys, and uh, I was ready. So. Did you go to the J Rob camp? I never did. Nope. I went to the Wartburg camp, the BV camp. I went to the Iowa camp. Um, trying to think. Uh, maybe 
that was it. But there was always camps around, you know. The Brands brothers were from Sheldon, which is the same was in the same conference as us. So they'd be doing a three day camp at Spirit Lake or Okaboji. I'd hit that, and then you know somebody else would be you know having a camp at Emmitsburg, you know, twenty minutes down the road, and we'd go to that one. So a mm-hmm. lot of little mini camps, I guess. But mm-hmm. do you remember when the Iowa camp was in that big field house? Like in the, like probably the ones you were working in the summertime. Yeah. yeah. It was like nine, 10 mats in there. Yep. It was hot. Hot, really hot. And I, uh, I grew up in the quad city, so I would come to that and went to it, I think maybe a couple times, but I got it for my birthday one year. I was young, but in between, you know, when we would be at like the calf, you guys would be working out. And a lot of the freestyle guys would be having their own practices in that same, you know, big area. And one year, I'll never forget, I went and was watching Bill Zadick. And after, and this is like, he might've had like a special wrestle off this year. I'd like to know what year it was, but it was like late in June and he was going full bore. And after a drill, I asked him for his signature and he went ballistic and he was so intense. And he was like, don't ever come to me again. Don't even touch this, Matt. Don't even look at it. And I was like, shell shocked. I couldn't believe it. And uh, I'll never forget that. But like that room, that big gym had these weird paintings on the walls and, uh, yeah, I'll, I'll never. I, I mean, you must have been there during that era too, like 02, 01, 03, somewhere yeah, in there. Yeah, sounds about right. Yeah, he he'd get pretty ornery when he was close to weight. I mean, that must have been it. <laughs> <laughs> he's ornery the way it was, anyways. But you get him close to weight, then you never know. <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, I just couldn't believe like how much those guys were sweating back then, and just the intensity. It was unbelievable to sneak back into the session sessions and watch as a young kid. Yeah, it was. I mean, I remember it was hard to get your footing. I mean, the, the mats were drenched. Mm-hmm. Uh, slide across the mat pretty easy. Now, when, before you get to Iowa, you put together an undefeated senior year up to your last match. I know it had to be a painful one, but like, how much did that impact your future trajectory as a wrestler? <clears throat> um, it just kind of knocks you on your butt, and then you, you get back, get back in the saddle. I mean, what do you do? I mean, so had you wrestled I, I, him before? I what's that? Had you wrestled him before? No, no. Really? So, not never before. Didn't really know anything about him. Um, maybe a little overconfident. Um, cause I, I don't know. I just pinned a lot of guys, and I didn't really have a lot of close matches. And at that time, my senior year, teams were forfeiting to me and bumping guys away. And mm-hmm. um, no, it was it was perfect timing. I mean, for that to happen, um, lit a fire under my butt and, you know, w- what else do you do? You just sign up for the next freestyle tournament, you know, Nick Pickford, and then you sign up for Northern Plains and just get on with it. I mean, there's nothing. Much yeah. To do. Were you undefeated your junior year as well? Yeah. Wow. So back, almost back to back undefeated seasons. That's you almost never see that. And like you had never wrestled this guy and he's from a, assumption. It sounds like. Right. Yep. Wow. What a, that's crazy. I mean, and I was asking more so just cause you know, you're a coach now you handle guys all the time where you know, they get their heart ripped out and they have to come back. And so was just curious kind of your, your take on it, looking back and, and how it impacted, uh, impacted your, your spring that year. No, it, it, it definitely did. I mean, like I said, lit fire, you know, this is, you know, I wanted to, I mean, I wanted to get to the next tournament as fast as I could to, to wrestle again, you know, mm-hmm. try to, get something back, but, uh, no, it was a good experience. Uh, but yeah, no, I, that's the only time we've ever wrestled. You know, he was a 49 pounder at UNI. I was 41. We never, mm. never only one time. That is wild. You almost, again, never see that, you know, the top guys are you wrestling the state finals. They're wrestling all the time. You know, that is crazy. So when you decided to go to Iowa central, had, did you know Mark Ostrander before that? Uh, no, not really. They, uh, they came into the picture and had me down to visit and, and they had a lot of good guys on the team. I mean, tough guys. And, and I didn't even have a clue. You know, I, I was kind of naive. I, I thought maybe I'd come in and hold my own pretty well in the room and no, nah, you come in. I think the very first day we got in the room, Tony Davis is standing in the middle of the wrestling mat. And there's about four of us rotating on him and he's just <laughs> making quick work out of all of us. So you were still there when he was there? Well, he was transitioning to you and I. 
So he was still there. This was like late summer. I don't know. Mm-hmm. Maybe it was moving weekend. We're moving into the dorms. A bunch of us grabbed our shoes, went up to the room, and he was still in town. And he, yeah, he took out like five of us. <laughs> what a specimen. How would you compare wrestling him versus wrestling a, a Doug Schwab? Uh, I mean, Tony, I mean, he's, he's so slick and he, he's, he's fast. His balance is unbelievable. I mean, you have like a double on him, pick him up. As soon as his toe touches the mat, you're getting, you know, you're going to get tossed, <laughs> you know, scrambling. And, you know, he was just real slick, you know, mm-hmm. how many two-time champs has there been since Tony Davis at Iowa central? Um, there's been a few, um, cause you redshirt a lot of guys now and I, you know, and it's actually pretty surprising that someone as good as Tony didn't redshirt his sophomore year, but you know, he had told me through interviews for the documentary that he wouldn't have been driven academically if he wasn't competing. So that's why he, he stayed in, but a lot of those studs from that era redshirted. So I didn't know if it had happened at all since Tony at Iowa central. Yeah, no, Tyler Hoffman, Jason Alpha, Todd small. Um, wow. There's, there's been, there's been a few. Yeah. Dana Holland. So he was my era. He won two of them. Wow. So. Yeah. That was the era of the Juco transfer as Kyle Klingman coined to me one time. You look at the, the guys in Juco. I mean, when Tony won his second Juco title, Brock Lesnar beat him for OW. And you had DC, you had King Mo, you had uh, yourself, TJ, Reggie Wright. Yeah, I mean, like, oh, my, just a a ton of talent back then in JUCOs. Yeah, no, they were power packed. I mean, um, that was just before I got into JUCOs. So, um, yeah, there's been some some talent that's came through. Oh, no question, especially during that era. But you go on to win the Big Tens for Iowa. What was your first full season at Iowa Central like? Iowa Central, um, I was kind of stuck between weight classes, 41, 49. That was the first year they did the weight certifications. Mm -hmm. I certified at 141.3. So I I got to wrestle 49. I don't think my attitude was really good. But I know at the end of that season, I wasn't going to stay the same. I needed to make some changes and um, because I wanted to win. Um, At that point, I was like, I don't know if anyone's going to recruit me you know, that kind of thing. And, uh, really after my freshman year, it was, uh, just a bad taste in my mouth. I'm like, this isn't, this isn't kind of, you know, what I want. So I need to make some changes and start doing some things different. Um, and then came in and got it done the next year. Yeah. What, what was your re- training routine like that summer leading into your sophomore year? Run left, wrestle as much as I could. Um, grab a hold of whatever training partners I could find. Uh, but I was in the weight room uh, every week, you know, mm-hmm. four or five times a week. Um, and so that was how I started my day. And uh, I think obviously it helped. And going into that second year, I made damn sure that I was going to get past the weight certification. <laughs> 41. Yeah. And then at the nationals, I, I, during the research, I couldn't find what year it was you won. So it was your sophomore year. Walk us through just what memories you have of, of that national title. Uh, it was kind of mentally I had made up my mind that this was going to happen. So I'm coming in pretty confident. I like where I'm at. Then all of a sudden, Stephen Bradley transfers from OU to Lincoln. So <laughs> Stephen Bradley teched me, I think, twice at Fargo. So wow. now I'm like, well, what the hell? Now I got this guy I got to take out. And I was like, well, I think we wrestled in the dual meet like in January. I'm like, well, we'll find out. We're going to find out. And I end up taking him down in overtime. So my confidence goes up. I'm like, I can beat this guy. So then we meet in the national finals. I'm down by two, about 30 seconds left. Inside trip him to his back for five. Um, it was a wild finish, you know. Wow. I did not oh. know that. Wow. So he had teched you at Fargo in high school. And so that was well, kind of playing yeah. into your mind. Wow. Oh, yeah. So 
So uh, then I'm thinking, well, how much did I really, how much ground did I actually gain over this, you know, time frame? And uh, yeah, we were over at the Lincoln Duels, and uh, I, I pulled him in. You know, I just kind of wore on him his gas tank a little bit, and over time, ends up taking him down. And all of a sudden, I'm like, all right, now I, I know I'm gonna beat him, <laughs> even though <laughs> it was pretty damn close. Yeah, that's pretty sweet though inside trip to, to the back for five. Um, and so after that, are you, are you for sure getting D one looks or not? Or since you were kind of a late bloomer in Juco, it was a little bit after that. Um, yeah, no, I took a visit to Northern Iowa and Nebraska and then, uh, to Iowa. And I mean, as soon as they offered me, I think probably my scholarship was enough to cover my books. You know, it's a pretty small scholarship. <laughs> as soon as they put that on the table, I'm like, yep, I'm coming. You know, that's where I wanted to go anyways. But um, mm-hmm. no, that was that was my goal. And, uh, you know, so I'm just just grateful to get that experience. I mean, what what it's like you said earlier, what a time to be there. When you were at being recruited by you and I, was Mark Manning the guy or was it Penrith? Yeah, it was, it was uh, Mark Manning and Penrith was assistant. Yep. I, I just, uh, you know, from that era, it just brings back good memories of Manning and, you know, being at UNI and taking that program really from like a really low point to building it back up, you know, before going to Nebraska. Yeah, no, they were, they were, uh, they were up there. And, and uh, the fact that Tony was there, um, you know, I knew somebody, you know, I knew a couple of the guys on the team as well, mm-hmm. you know, a couple of buddies, but, um, you know, you see Tony Davis leave Iowa Central and then go over to UNI and, have success immediately. Um, no, it was a definitely good, good option. And then what was your first duel at Carver? We're in the black gold. Uh, I, don't <laughs> I don't even remember. Some but people I mean, it's like sizzled into their mind. Like they know, like the day, the time, the weather, you know, when, when that first one happened. Yeah, actually. So that documentary that, that we were talking about, that was my first season, you know, of, of jumping back into eligibility. So, um, we were out, yeah, we, we went out East Pennsylvania and, Oh yeah. Uh, we wrestled Hofstra and, um, Penn and Princeton. Um, I, I can't really recall the first one cause I know we wrestled Iowa state at Hilton that year, but every time you step into Carver, I mean, it's, uh, It'll, it'll grab your attention. I mean, it's, it's an <laughs> intimidating place to compete at. And whether you're wearing the black and gold or the other, you know, singlet. Um, but obviously, you just want to go out and perform and and uh, get the job done. Yeah, now that you say that, I'm, I'm getting flashbacks from the season. Actually, the the one that I can remember is when you wrestled Butkey in the wrestle-off at Carver. That, yeah. I mean, that well, wasn't like, you know, official Iowa, but, you know, basically getting the spot. Then, yeah, I think it was that pensive. The pin duel, though, Bucky wrestled. I, I, you know, the Bucky storyline, I'll never forget. You know, he was like, he was really played up in that film. I, maybe he was filling in for Zadik at that duel pen. Yeah, I think Mike had ribs, something with his ribs that day. That That's day, right. Whatever. Yeah. So after your career at Iowa, how did you get linked up to Iowa Central? Because you basically had one job your whole life, and it's been the head coach at Iowa Central. It's pretty awesome. Uh, I, I, Mark Jurgens and I went down to Atlanta for one season, one wrestling season and coached a club down there together. And it wasn't, the level wasn't really what I, really what I wanted. So I needed to be in a room with guys that were hungry to win and, you know, wanted to train with a purpose and not feel like I was running a daycare. Um, Cause that's kind of the way it was. Um, I mean, I still remember parent came up to me. He's like, you wrestle in college? I go, yeah. Where at? I wrestle in Iowa. Oh, they got wrestling there. And I'm, I'm like, I need to get out of this place and get the get with some guys that want to train. And 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 Troy Bennett actually called me. He's like, hey, this job's open, and maybe you should apply for this job. And so it it worked out well. I mean, back to where you know a place that helped me um, and just give back. 
Yeah, Troy Bennett, one of the best in the business. Shout out to you, Troy. I'm sure you're listening to this. I didn't know you went down to Atlanta because that's about the same time, or Georgia area. That's about the same time that Jurgens and Strip Matter were starting Young Guns, probably. Were you guys doing like something similar to that? It was similar. Uh, kind of what happened is th they flew us down for this interview. We accepted. Uh, we were both going to coach this program or this training facility. Well, then everything fell, fell apart. Uh, the building now wasn't going to be built for a year and uh, just all kinds of things happened. So a guy we knew down there basically set us up on a schedule where we'd go to like five or six different high schools a week. So maybe Monday, Wednesday, we were at Chattahoochee and then we were at uh, Buford one night and then we were at uh, Stars Mill and, you know, Collins Hill a couple of days a week. So what'd you do during the day? Uh, we worked at trust tech. We engineered roof trusses and floor trusses. And they basically hired us on Mark and I and trained us for about six months. And Mark's like, I'm getting out of here. And I, I'm like, I'm right behind you. As soon as, <laughs> as, soon as the state tournament's over and the season wraps, we're, we're going back to Iowa. Uh, so that's, that's kind of what happened. And the Iowa central job fell you know, perfect timing for that. That's amazing. How, how long was it from when you took the job to when you won the first, first national title as a team under your watch? Uh, the first year, I think we were eighth and then we won it. Uh, then we started winning them in 2006. So and you won four, five. Four, four, five was, uh, we were eighth at nationals, I believe. And then, then we won, won a few few is putting it lightly first to everyone five straight who were some of the studs in those early teams was that like the john jones era or was that after that john jones matt column um uh, eric hoffman who was davenport mm -hmm. uh, they were the first three on that first team and then you know had some matt uh, column an illinois legend oh my <laughs> god what a i forgot about that name i didn't know he went out there yeah no he he was uh he was a national champ for us in 06. So dude's a, yeah, a was... brick shit house <laughs> from what I remember yeah. of him. Um so you then you went you put together five straight. I mean, as you look back on it from when you took the program over to when you started winning, what were some of like the big changes in terms of whether it was recruiting or how you ran the season or the workouts? Because a lot of coaches will say, I thought I knew how to do it, and then a year later I changed a lot of things because I you know, had a kind of a misconception of what it would be. So like, what was your experience just from like year one to year two? Um, just getting more guys in. I mean, uh, I don't know how to say recruiting. It. Yeah. Recruiting. Um, and I mean, we were, I pushed them pretty hard and probably did got away with doing things that maybe you wouldn't today. I mean, um, I think me mentally they were, very prepared um, to compete, especially at the end of the year. Um, and, you know, academically, you know, I was right there sitting beside them and study, you know, study table um, where that was probably diff that was different than uh, when I went to school here. Um, it was kind of just like, yeah, get your time in, you know, academics and, you know, so doing the little things to keep guys eligible and get their degrees and, you know, be successful later in life too. Mm -hmm. And then, wow. Cause so, cause back then, you know, right now, a lot of Juco guys, you know, they might go D2, they might go NAIA back then. Was that as common or were most guys going to Juco either because they wanted to go D1 or because they just want to keep wrestling? Um, it's, it's a little different. I think for everybody, um, we always, you know, if somebody came in and won a national title right away, we'd always let them red, red shirt their second year and save their eligibility for division one, you know, three, three years. Um, and, and we had a lot of guys, you know, take the D one path, but I mean, we've also had national champs at every other level. I mean, NAI D two, D three, um, you know, even, you know, Edwin Cooper, I mean, look at that Frank Cagnina, Terrell Wilborn and Edwin Cooper all, one, two, three in the division two that one year. And then Coop, you know, 
transfers to Iowa, but uh, that stuff's fun to see. I mean, you, you want the best for all your guys when they leave, but um, we enjoy watching them compete, you know, when they after they leave and be successful. And um, some of them are coaching. A lot of them are coaching now. So mm-hmm. um, it's kind of a big circle, you know. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you mentioned Evan Cooper, another Illinois name that just a dominant high school wrestler. And Akui came out there with him. What memories do you have of those two guys wrestling for you? Uh, Coop had a motor. I mean, he was, and when the lights were on, he was even better. Uh, Akui, he, I mean, pretty hard to score on. <laughs> pretty goofy guy. Uh, but awesome. I mean, awesome to have in the program. Uh, and you know, both of them characters, you know, so yeah, I, you have to have your guard up a lot of times. Oh it was, man. It was fun having those guys in the program. We took a to a couple of tournaments back in the day and I'll just, just never forget how silly he is and how loose he was, you know, yeah. <laughs> whereas like when I was going, I thought you had to be like serious and a hard ass and it just like going with those guys, just a whole different view of, I mean, one, they, they never lost. So like when you're, you're going with those guys, they're always winning. So the course they're laid back, you know, it was, uh, it was quite an experience, uh, a couple of tournaments that we went to with Juwan. Yeah, no, he, and he's doing well now too. I see he's got the, the, the Harvey twisters rolling again or helping out there. So that's, that's mm-hmm. cool to see. definitely. Yeah. And then at, at little coop is down at, uh, I think he's still down in New Mexico training MMA. So expect big things out of him how did the great john jones end up on your doorstep how did that happen uh we were in cleveland at high school nationals um recruiting troy and i were and just happened to be sitting next to arthur his dad just start talking to him all of a sudden we look you know he's got two boys you know art and john and uh like this kid's good so we start watching him then we figure out you know he had Art and he had John. They were about a year, year and a half apart in age, but they're the same grade. So Art, you know, academically, he was way up here. John needed a little help, you know. Mm-hmm. So Art goes to Syracuse. John comes to Iowa Central. Um, and we had Joe Soto and John Jones flew in same weekend for their visits. And they, they both end up fighting in the UFC and they were roommates. And one's from New York, one's from California. And <laughs> wow blew him out to the cornfield to iowa what what kind of uh high school talents did john jones have come in was he state champ or kind of yeah, hidden in the weeds state champ his his senior year um and then he was fourth at high school nationals in a weight class that had Pasillo, varner patrick bond i mean askren max i mean loaded weight and ends up fourth were there a lot of other guys going for him recruiting? Uh, I think, I think with, you know, the trouble is with the admissions, getting him in. Mm-hmm. So he was pretty much a lock for junior college and we, we jumped on him right away and got him out here. And were you coaching him when he wrestled Askren in college? Yeah. Yeah. At the, at the UNI open. What grade was he when that all went down? He was, that would have been a second year red shirt, his red shirt year. So how did that one go? Uh, he was hyped for it. He was hyped for it. I, I think it was first round. Um, but it was it first was round. Yeah, it was a good match. And he, I think he, John got second at that tournament and lost to BJ Padden in the, in the finals. And I mean, he's beating good guys and he, he gets, I think Padden was ranked like second in the country at the time for Nebraska. And John, goes double overs and tosses him off the side of the mat <laughs> as they're going out of bounds didn't score any points and then bj came back in and like gave him a couple hard clubs and let him know who was <laughs> who was the you know the old bull yeah for and was when when did colby come through colby was john so the very next year so it would have been that same year actually so john's redshirt year was colby's freshman year I mean, I can't even, as I'm saying these names, it's just crazy to me, all the studs you've coached. And I know Kane was there maybe before you got there, but man, I mean, we're talking about some of the, the all-time greats and, uh, you know, they all stepped foot in the Iowa Central wrestling room. Pretty amazing. when you look back at it. 
yeah, there's been been some great, some good guys, some tough guys. One of which that you know we just had on the podcast, Richie Lewis. He tells a story about you know he came in troubled past, as he said, you know, kind of in and out of trouble. Gets to Iowa Central, gets second in the country, loses to the Cuban in the finals. I can't remember the gentleman's name. Yanzi. Yeah, I mean, he is. Yeah. Yep. And he, that kind of flip, flipped the switch. He goes, you know, hyper focused, starts training, does everything right, so to speak. And then the next year loses in the first round at Nationals. And your guys had a pretty tough opening round, but went on to win it. What, what do you remember from that one? It was a, it was a roller coaster ride for sure. Um, I think we were in 31st place after that. And I'm, I'm not even paying attention to the score. Someone comes up, Oh, we're in 31st place. I'm like, we had lost, I think we had seven first round matches. We lost three of them or something like that. And I'm like, Whoa, this ain't, ain't going good. And I'm worried about Richie Lewis, you know, getting his head back on straight and, you know, try to salvage what you can and help the team win a national title. And, that's what he did. I had to talk to him probably four or five times before he got on board, you know, short 10 minute talk or five minute talk, leave him alone, go back, do it again. And he got back on board and he tore through the back of that bracket. I mean, bonus pointed everybody. Um, wow. So a lot of that national title, that team title 15 was attributed to him, you know, Mm-hmm. You know, blazing through the back, scoring bonus, and you know it, what's it say to the rest of the team too? You know, hey, he's fighting back. We, you know, we got to chip in, do our our part too. So it was a good team. It was, a, it was a, I mean, I still remember that morning walking down to the lobby to get a coffee, and the Clackamas assistant coach is smiling at me. He gives me a, and they were up by like fourteen points, and they had a bunch of guys in the semis. I think they went like one for, I think they had like seven, six or seven guys in the semis and they won like one match or two matches, two out of seven or something like that. And we pushed everybody through and got everybody, you know, wrestling. We were on fire the next day. I think we lost uh, like 20 some matches and lost like one. Is this the Brandon Wright, Pat Downey era as well? This is, uh, Pat Downey was on the team, Tyler Hoffman, Jason Alpha. Those three were national champs. Uh, Richie was third. Chris Ballard, Illinois guy, was mm-hmm. third or fourth. Um, Alex De La Cruz was third. Uh, New York guy, you know, he won 25. Uh, we had, you know, Teddy Harvey was All-American, Ryan Niven. So it was just a good team. It was a good team effort. And Yeah. You don't forget that one for sure. I mean, Richie and uh, even Troy was like, man, he was a low place after that, you know, and and if he doesn't come back through, there's no team title. And uh, it it just, you feel for the guy because he got in second the year before doing it the way he wanted. And then he, you know, makes some changes and then it still doesn't work out. And that's when it really hurts for a guy. No. And he, you know, I think he beat Mejias three times that year, the guy who won it. Um, So the defending champ beat him. He went, three and all against him that season. So, I mean, everything was looking good. You know, he, he got caught, you know, and, and the guy that pinned him, the headlocked him is my assistant coach. Now one of my assistants. That's what Troy was saying. That's crazy. Ryan Coakley. Yeah. He's got, he's got a mean left-handed headlock. <laughs> <laughs> well, and as you, as you look ahead, you know, I know you guys just added women's wrestling. Is that's really exciting. Is that still going on or is there, is that going to be this year or next year? It's this year. Uh, our, our head coach, Zach Hensley, he's got uh, 20 some girls already uh, committed. So it, it's fine. You know, it's, it's going in the right direction. That's awesome. That's a no, no doubt going to be a big catalyst for wrestling moving forward. You know, the next 10 years, getting all these women's teams on board. And, you know, the, the one thing I was going to ask you that I could not figure out from the, from the research was, are there multiple divisions in JUCO, like scholarship and non-scholarship? And like, how does that work? Yep. So there's division three and division one, but we all, so the way they do it, they, they still crown, you know, they'll basically have the top scoring division three school will win the division three national title and Mm -hmm. vice versa. But um, 
but yeah, there's, it's about 50, 50, um, with D threes and D ones. So. And you're D one. Yep. I mean, Iowa central is such a dynasty and, uh, junior college sports. I, I can't remember what the, the trophy is called, like the overall champ, but you guys win that all the time. Yeah. I think it's like 13 out of the last 15 years, just for athletics overall, we've been the top junior college for athletics in the country. Wow. And the campus is huge too. And you know, it's amazing to me, even still that you talk to some guys and they're just not familiar with the junior college scene. And in one of my buddies out East, when we did the Tony Davis documentary, the guy, actually the guy who helped me do it, he wasn't familiar with the junior college scene. And I just was shocked because so many guys from Illinois have had great success in JUCO. Um, you know, and so if, if someone's listening to this, what's a good recruit for you? Someone who, um, that you would really want to have in the program. Um, I mean, we like guys that, you know, obviously that are team, they're team oriented. Um, cause our goal is always going to be to win a team national title. Um, and it helps uh, when you get guys that, you know, want to fit the mold and be on a team. Um, and I mean, we get guys that, you know, want to go the JUCO route to boost their academics. Uh, we also get guys that maybe are just getting asked to walk on at a division one school and they want to kind of up their stock a little bit and, and, and then transfer. Um, we get other people that, you know, they see the price tag on some of those four year schools, the private schools, and, you know, they can come here for two years and be less than one year, you know, at some of the bigger schools and then transfer your credits in and mm -hmm. you know, finish up. So, um, every, every case, every, every guy that comes in, to, you know, has their own story, but, um, now we just want to help, help them out. Yeah. And it's, um, I went to community college, didn't wrestle in college, but I mean, it just seems like a, a good route for so many people because like I was terrible at some of those standardized tests. The great thing about JUCO is if you go and get straight A's in JUCO, a lot of that stuff overwrites anything you did in high school. It's a kind of a fresh start. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And, and for some of the guys like myself, you know, I, I didn't have any confidence as a student when I left high school. I, I mean, I cared about wrestling. <laughs> I didn't always <laughs> do my studies the way I should have, but yeah. Uh, but during the two years I was here, I had a good semester. I'm like, Holy shit, I can do this. And then I had another good semester and another good semester. So confidence in the classroom is a big thing too. Oh, it's huge. I mean, that's, that's, I would think, you know, a lot of the, when I think about that show, last chance you, which I, I don't know if you've watched that or not on Netflix, the football yeah. powerhouse school, a lot of those guys talk about that, you know, just, uh, you know, insane talent, insane skills, but either didn't have the grades to get in or didn't have the grades to stay. Now I know that's not every guy in your lineup, but every year I'm sure you have a couple that are those, those blue chip kids who just for whatever reason had to go the Juco route for grades. Yeah, no, it's, it's, and it's a, it's a good path. I mean, and I lived it, you know, and all our coaches that are on staff all came through Iowa central. So, um, you know, we, we walk, you know, the same path. So, mm -hmm. um, and it's not a bad deal. I mean, I had buddies that went to Iowa right away when I transferred in there, I had good GPA. I had all my core classes done and they're still struggling trying to pass their English, their math, their science where I got it. You know, I had it all wrapped up. I was ready to, you know, it, it was a good, good option. Yeah, no, it's, it's great, man. We're a big fan of Iowa central and just so, uh, so grateful that you could take some time and come on the show today. You know, the last question we ask everyone coaches, how did wrestling change their life? Whenever I talk to a coach, it's pretty clear wrestling is their life, but you know, if you're, uh, you know, if you're talking to a young person, you know, what are you saying? Some of the reasons that you love the sport are. Uh, I mean, it pretty much every, pretty much everything I have is because of wrestling. You know, the reason I went to college, got a degree, you know, came back to Fort Dodge is all because of wrestling. And, um, because of that, I met my wife, you know, had started a family. So, you know, wrestling kind of, um, kept me focused and, and, uh, now I get to, you know, help, help other people. Um, so it's like a big circle. So. Absolutely. And if you come up to, to, up to the shy to do any recruiting, please let me know. It would be good to grab some deep dish, toss a few back, talk some wrestling. Yeah. Heck yeah. I appreciate you having me.
Absolutely, Coach. Thanks again.